to praise you, to honor you. Acts 13 says that as they praised, as they ministered to you, that you came among them and your voice was heard, your direction was given. They encountered you by praising you. They encountered you by being the priest that you'd called them to be. And today we, we choose, we decide, we're not going to be a spectator. We're not going to be like those in Acts chapter 2 when you encountered the 120 as they ministered to you for 10 days. You encountered them with your glory and your mighty fire and the outpouring of your spirit and the demonstration of your spirit. We don't want to be like those who said, what does this mean? What is this? What's going on? We don't want to be a spectator. We want to be a participator. And so we receive that priestly calling. We step into it this morning, and we direct our words and our heart toward you this morning, Father. We come before your throne with honor and worship. We let go of all that's going on in this world. All the good, all the bad, all the ugly. We let it go. And we come up before you with praise and adoration in our hearts. We step into the spirit realm where we live and will live for eternity. And we worship and adore you this morning. We praise and adore you this morning. We exalt you, our King. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to you, Father. Glory and credit and honor and praise. Thank you for all that you've done in my life, Lord. Thank you for allowing me to be born on this earth. Thank you for giving me that plan that you've got for my life and every life that's in here and under the sound of my voice. Oh, we know the enemy comes and he does what he does, but God, he can't even hold a candle to you. Your destiny for our life and the plans you have for us are sure and steadfast. And so we take your hand as our shepherd. And we choose to follow you by the Holy Spirit, not out of our own minds, our own souls, out of our own religious attempts to please, but God, we come and we yield to you. We praise you. The most spiritual thing we can do is get out of your way so you can do something. We yield to you this morning. We yield our minds and our lives. We will not pre-plan this service for you. We will not pre-plan our lives for you, but we exalt you this morning. And we set our eyes on you. And we will not be distracted. If we catch ourselves like Peter looking at wind and waves, we're going to turn and look at you again. So that we can walk with you in the place that you're walking. We give you glory this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. Let the name of the Lord be exalted in this place today. Let the name of the Lord be praised in this place today. Let the name of the Lord be lifted up. Let Jesus be seen. Let the Holy Spirit be honored. Let the angels minister. Let the cloud of witnesses testify. In the name of Jesus, let the judge of all the earth make the calls that he needs to make and the judgments and the decrees. Hallelujah. Oh, we give you praise, Lord. We choose to live in the throne room today. We choose to walk in that place with you today. We press through the veil of our flesh and step into where you dwell. We give you glory this morning, Father. We honor you this morning, Father. Oh, hallelujah. We love you, Father. You are worthy, Lord. You're so worthy. Worthy, 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 worthy. Wonderful. You are love. We receive your love. We receive your love. Nothing is impossible for you. Oh, we thank you, Father. <laughs> oh, I give you glory, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I say sickness and disease, it's bowing its knee right now in Jesus' name. I command every foul demonic attack or attempt, any demon spirit that might be present harassing anyone, I command you bow your knee in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ, the covenant of God against you. 
we draw a, not only a blood line around the people, we apply a blood covering over the people. The life and the DNA and the nature of God. The light of God. Hallelujah. Darken minds. Be enlightened in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. We praise you today, Lord. Your will be done on earth. Your will be done in Madeira. Your will be done in the Believer's Church of Madeira today, as it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, we yield to you. Say what you need to say. Do what you need to do. We honor you. What a privilege it is to walk with you and to know you. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. Oh, we praise you, Father. We honor you, Father. Hallelujah. We love you, Father. We rejoice in you, Father. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. How many of you believe Vicki, if you're watching or whenever you're watching this, Vicki, you need to submit yourself to God in this moment and resist the devil, and he's going to flee. Take your stand. Submit yourself to God right now. You can't beat this yourself. Resist the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ, and he'll leave. He's got to go. Amen. Amen. That was for a word for somebody online. We're online live right now, so Vicki was her name, yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. How many of you believe God is victorious? How many of you believe God doesn't sit around and worry? His throne room is not a place of worry or fear. Amen? Well, if you want to be more like that, learn to go and be with him. Amen. The way, you'll be, you, know, the way you get like somebody else is you're with them. Husbands and wives that live together for a long time, they spend a lot of time together, they become like each other in a lot of ways. Amen. And the only way you're going to be victorious like God is, is go be with him. Not just read about him, hear testimonies about him. That's good, that's encouraging. But he, the one thing he's after is you. And what I mean by that is you just come to him and say, God, I want to be with you. I don't even know maybe what that means or how to do that, but I'm here, and your word says that if I'll intertwine myself, if I'll wait upon you, if I'll intertwine myself, like it says in Isaiah, with you, that I'll have that which I need, which is you. I'll be more like you. I'll renew my strength. The enemy will not be able to drag me around with fear or worry or lies, condemnation, shame, whatever it is. Oh, hallelujah. You can't, you know, just like Moses, you can't go up and sit in his presence and not come down the mountain looking like, not looking like him. You will look like him. You'll have his word in your mind to offset the enemy's lies and your own opinions, and you'll have his glory on your flesh. He's calling us to him. Most important thing you can do every day of your life is be with him. I'm not going to tell you how, when, or where, or how much, or how long. But I'm telling you, if you make that the priority of your life, your life will change forever. I'm not saying you won't go to heaven if you don't do that. But why live in hell until you go to heaven? When you can do what Jesus said we need to do, have heaven on earth. Even old covenant people, according to Hebrews, or according to Deuteronomy, he says, if you'll just walk with me and live with me in this thing I've given you, he said, you'll have the days of heaven on earth. 
Hell may be going on all around you, but you can live in heaven. I know that sounds crazy. That's because we've learned to live in hell, and in some cases decided that's where we have to live. But I'm telling you, no, you don't have to live there. Father, teach us how to do that. First step is toward you as we make room for you in our lives to be with you, to know you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, praise him. One more time, give him honor and praise before you're seated. Thank you, Lord. We love you and bless you and praise you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad he's working on you? He's working in you. <laughs> Amen. Um, just go ahead. If you need an offering envelope, just lift your hand. I'm going to kind of do this backwards a little bit. I'm going to do announcements real quick here while you're preparing your offering. A um, uh, few things coming up. Tuesday uh, at 6.30, we move staff meeting to this Tuesday. So heads of department, it'll be this Tuesday at 6.30. Uh, come on out, and uh, we need to have a meeting. Um, and then on July the 20th through the 22nd is Born for This Youth Conference. Uh, they're going to have a small meeting after service. So those of you uh, that's, that's youth are going or youth, if you're here, uh, we're going to have just, uh, Josiah's going to meet with you up front here concerning this uh, conference coming up this week. Um, also, the uh, fifth annual uh, Madera Count, uh, Commu County uh, Food Bank is, dinner's coming up, and it's a fundraiser for them. And uh, so if you want to be a part of that, uh, just you'll see the insert in here. Uh, August 25th through 22nd, Father and Son Camping Trip is coming up. You need to sign up in the vestibule for that. Uh, Ted also, he's not here today. Uh, a group of men went on a fishing trip, so uh, he's a part of that. Um, there's a, um, uh, he's got t-shirts for sale also, and I've seen the, the, the photo type of them, and they're really nice looking t-shirts, and so they're $15 a piece if you contact him uh, concerning that. And also, you'll notice there's a conference coming up that's going to be here at the church. The church isn't putting it on. We're just hosting it. Can you find pastor in this picture? <laughs> and uh, we, we laughed about that when we put it in the white, black and white. You know, you can really tell where pastor's at. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's got that Irish glow on him. But um, uh, uh, this is coming up. Uh, I want us to be involved in that. I want our church to be involved in, um, you know, the the building up of unity in the body of Christ, amen? Uh, everybody's got a place, everybody's got a part, everybody's got supply to give. We need everybody, amen? And so this is the Father's Release Conference coming up. I just want to encourage you to write that down and be a part of it and uh, put it on your calendar, praise God. Hallelujah. Well, turn over with me uh, over to uh, Proverbs, the uh, 20, uh, 28th chapter. Hallelujah. The Bible says in uh, uh, Proverbs 28, 20, it says a faithful man will, say will, will. abound with blessings, not in them, with them. I misquote that sometimes. Of course, it might be in translation. It might be in blessings. New King James says with blessings. So the faithful man shall abound in blessings. Everybody wants to go, woohoo, yay, abound with blessings. But there's a qualification for those blessings, and it's called faithfulness. And this word faithful, I was sharing with Pastor before service today, this word faithful here in Proverbs 28 is the, is the Hebrew word imuah. Imuah, I think is how you say it. And it sounds like you're getting a kiss, mwah. But uh, it's imuah, and it means, it means to be uh, uh, Let's see, it means to be, uh, stu have stability, fidelity, steadiness, enduring, unchanging, fixed, firm. You know, I was, when I was speaking earlier about renovation of your house or demolition, demolition, you have to have demolition before you can have um, uh, renovation. And, uh, and you know, the faithfulness in that, faithfulness Faithfulness, God explained it to me one day when, I was, when he, he started talking to me about faithfulness. He told me, he says, faithfulness is of great value in the kingdom of heaven. 
He said faithfulness is a, a decision not to quit. Faithfulness is, a, it's not what you do or don't do. It's a decision you make not to quit. I mean, what if you got your house all tore down and you're, you're, you're rebuilding it and, and you get it all tore down and you just quit? That's not a very good idea. But see, that's what happens to us as Christians. You know, our firm foundation, our foundation is the cross. Our foundation uh, is already laid by the prophets and the apostles. The foundation is laid. And so when we get born again, like I said earlier, we're as righteous as we're ever going to be. But there has to be a building on that foundation. And like I said before, the devil wants to put junk in your, in your walls. <laughs> And, and, and it's up to us, just like it was up to Adam and Eve, to guard the garden. Well, you've got to guard your, the rebuilding of your life the right way. See, God's taken it down to the foundation. He's wiped away the old, and he's brought you to a foundation of, at the cross. He's brought you to this foundation, and now he wants to build something on it. And he begins to put the walls up and the plumbing in. He begins to do all that he needs to do to make you who he designed you. See, your blueprint's in heaven. <laughs> your blue, God knows exactly what you're going to look like when he's finished with you. And so, so he begins to build, and, and we start getting discouraged in our flesh. Oh, I don't read the Bible enough. Oh, I don't pray enough. I just quit. That's not faithfulness. Faithfulness, God, I know I'm human. You know I'm human. You know I have frailties. You know I have frustrations. And frustrations is simply you trying to, you trying to make your life the way you think it ought to be instead of yielding to what he wants it to be. And we get mad at ourselves. We get mad at people. We get, we get all tweaked out of shape at us. And we're just going to quit. I just quit. I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not going to pray anymore. Nothing's working right. I just quit. And I'll ask you what God asked me one day. And where are you going to quit to? <laughs> what are you going to do? Jesus asked his disciples. He said, they had a better answer than I did. <laughs> He's asked his disciples, everybody else is leaving me. Are you going to go too? And they said, oh, no, because you have the words of life. God knows how to finish the job. And so he says here, a faithful man. Now, I want you to see this scripture and what I just said. A faithful man, one that doesn't quit, will abound with blessings. You don't quit. You don't quit. You get the blessings of God. You get the help of God in your life. And that verse is the same, that, that word faithful there is the same word that's over in Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by faith. That's the same word, faithfulness. Faithful. You've got to make a decision. I'm not quitting. I may fail. I may fall on my face. I may skin my knees. I may sprain my wrist. <laughs> but I'm not quitting. God, I'm not quitting. The devil says, oh, look how bad everything is. God, I'm not quitting. Because if you won't quit, you'll abound with blessings. Amen? Take your tithing off in your hands. Father, we thank you and we praise you today for your goodness. We thank you, Father God, for your word. Oh, my goodness, what building supplies we have. God, there's nothing missing, nothing lacking in your word, Father God, that won't get us to our destiny, won't get us to where you've designed us to stand. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you today. We will not quit. We will not quit because, God, you are faithful to us. You won't quit on us. And so, Father, we thank you and we praise you. And I thank you that as we give, it shall be given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men give to us. And we bless you and we honor you, sir, in Jesus' name. Amen. shall be mine. That must really be out of the archives. I don't even remember that one. <laughs> Anybody in here remember that? 
Look at all you folks that are have that uh, anointed recall, I guess. Huh? Let's all stand. Praise God. I, I like it, though, even though I can't remember it. It's good. I need to sing that one more often. Victory is ours in him. Lord, we thank you that your word says that you overcame for us. And all we got to do is step into you because you've already overcome. And so today we minister this offering. Hallelujah. I know that, Lord, I can remember days in my life where the devil was screaming in my ear, you better keep your money because you're going to need it and you don't have enough, da, 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 da. But, Lord, I know maybe there's somebody in here today, I don't know, that, that to, for them to even put an, an offering or a tithe in this basket today, was they had to fight every devil in hell practically just to do it. But, God, I thank you that you are a faithful God. And I thank you that as this comes up before our high priest in heaven who receives the, the spiritual substance of faith out of every tithe and offering that's given, that he puts his hands on it and blesses it with the anointing oil and with the water of life that comes from his ministry. Not only is their life blessed and they are, they're increased, but God, others all over this world are touched and blessed. We thank you for that. And Lord, I honor them for their boldness of being a tither and not quitting and not giving up. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I forgot to grab my lapel mic you guys go ahead and just say hi to each other for a couple of minutes while i put this on amen all right all right glory it's good to say hi to the family isn't it hey one more uh, real quick announcement uh cj wanted me to announce this thursday at 10 o'clock is when uh, he and ron or 10 30 10 Yeah, be here at 10 o'clock. Uh, he does his uh, internet uh, program called Firestarters. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe you don't have the time to watch that. Of course, you can watch it on the archives, too. But uh, try to hook into that or connect into that. How do they do it, CJ? YouTube, Firestarters. And then, then spread the word on that across the internet because there's some... <laughs> Powerful things that are ministered and said and done on that program every week. And we've had people tell us they were going to commit suicide until they watched that program. You know, and different things, uh, healings and different things that have happened. And so uh, CJ and Ron are uh, the ones who do the program every Thursday. And it would be good for you to watch it too. But this Thursday he's going to have a Christian comedian on for the first time, Lonnie Pelly. Lonnie was here in service with us a couple of Sunday nights ago. And so, uh, you know, most of us in here need to laugh a little more than we do anyway. Amen. 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 I just get up in the morning and look in the mirror and start my day laughing. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, anyway, we need some folks to come, or we'd like for some folks to come. It's kind of hard for a comedian to, you know, do his thing when nobody's in the audience. And we don't have the fake laughter here like they have on TV. So if you can break free and, and get away at 10 o'clock on Thursday and come on down and uh, just uh, be with uh, CJ and Ron and I'm going to be here. I'm going to laugh loud too. Yeah. Amen. So come be, I'm going to cut loose. That's right. Praise God. Well, Father, we give you praise today. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, we lift up Scott who's facing this surgical procedure. We lift up Loretta who's in the hospital right now, Father. And we ask you, Lord, to just as a congregation, we come into agreement. We thank you for ministering to them. Your word says, your Bible says that you sent your word and healed them and delivered them from all their afflictions. And so we agree with that scripture right now. And we ask you, Father, to send the angels, to send the body of Christ. Let the Holy Spirit come, however he wants to, through whomever he wants to, to minister to them. We agree for their healing and their help and their strength and their recovery in Jesus' name. And may they know that it was you that have helped them, Father. Holy Spirit, we trust you this morning. Uh, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. 
And so we ask you to say some things to us in our hearts, reveal some things. We open the door of our heart to you today. We're not going to be like Adam and Eve who thought they could do their life without God and succeed. We know we can't. Most of us in here have tried it, and we've been proven that it won't work. So we open our heart today, Lord. You know what we need to hear, what we need to see, what we need to understand today. And so, Holy Spirit, we trust you to get that over to us today. And we will not just be hearers only, but we'll be doers of what you show us. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Amen. Well, grab your Bible if you have it, or your electronic device, which is your Bible nowadays, I guess. You know, I, I, I have trouble writing notes on mine. It just doesn't seem to be enough room on the screen. So I I got one of these. (laughs) I like to write lots of stuff in my Bible to lead me to different scriptures and all of that. So it's good to have a, you know, cell phone or whatever to use. But I encourage you to get your own Bible and mark it up. Amen. Not with your ideas, with the ideas he gives you. Praise God. Uh, Turn with me over to, uh, let's go over to to, uh, uh, Isaiah. Isaiah 51, Isaiah 51, if you've been here uh, off and on for a while, we've talked about the season, the spiritual season we're in, and you know, it's a very important thing to know that, I know there's some people don't even believe there's spiritual seasons, but, uh, and I actually, to be honest, I was one of those people at one time, but the Lord showed me different. That just like, you know, the Bible says the whole natural realm is a picture, a type and shadow of the spirit realm. Parallel, Parallel that's right. And just as there are natural seasons, there's, there's summer, there's winter. How many of you know which one we're in right now? <laughs> Not too hard to figure it out, is it? We're in summer. But between summer and winter, there's those two transitional seasons. Two out of the four seasons are transitional seasons. What does that mean? That means that you're moving from one season that was established, like summer. We don't have to, especially here in July, we don't have a whole lot of spring in summer right now, do we? Because it's been established. But during the transition season, you get a little of the season that was, and you get a little of the season that's coming. And there's this mixture. And so you get up in the morning and turn on Channel 30 and see what, you know, the temperature is going to be that day to see whether do I wear a coat today or do I not? Because we're in springtime and it might be cold today or it might be warm. And that transitional season is a season where you have to pay attention, like I was just saying, to what's going on because you're headed into something. Now, spiritual seasons are the same way. People get frustrated because they don't know where they're at spiritually. And the enemy takes advantage of our ignorance in that or our lack of knowledge in that area And he wants us to set up shop, put down, you know, tent pegs and and set up somewhere that we are and stay there forever. He doesn't want us to move forward into the fullness of the plan of God in our lives. And so right now. You know, and there again, you can see this in the spirit realm because, or in the natural realm, because it's reflecting what's going on in the spirit. There's much change, upheaval. You know, people reacting to change, whether it's political change or some other kind of change. People are reacting. Demonic spirits that have been entrenched in people's lives and even in institutions are being, as Karen said, things are being ripped down and torn apart and uprooted. And the enemy is panicked and he's screaming and he's angry and he's doing all that he's doing. But God is at work as well. You know, Jeremiah was told that he was going to be given a prophetic ministry over the nations and that prophetic anointing and authority he would walk in would pull down, throw down, uproot, and then build and plant. God doesn't just tear things apart. After he redoes things or removes what's in the way, then he builds and plants his kingdom. And so we're in a time right now where God is doing that very thing. Jesus' ministry was a time like that. 
He came into the earth. He read the scriptures out of Isaiah 61 that, that spoke of the Messiah and that when, when the Messiah would come, that he would begin to tear apart what the enemy had established when people were sick or people were confused or people were demonized or, or they needed wisdom. The Messiah would come in and he would tear all of that apart and replace it with the kingdom of God by healing people, by teaching people, by blessing people. He began to decree that's who he was and that's what he was there to fulfill. He even said there in, in Luke 4, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. But because the people didn't understand what spiritual season they were in, they rejected God walking around on two legs. Just because you're religious or because you're a Christian doesn't mean you know what you're doing. Now, I'm not throwing rocks at you this morning because I've <laughs> I walked through this all this myself as well. Yeah. I was just thinking this morning how many years I was so ignorant of what worship and praise and music was in church. Yeah. I thought I was just singing songs, yeah. you know, so everybody kind of feel good and kind of, you know, set the mood. <laughs> everybody just calm down a little. That's not what it is at all. It's ministry. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Well, I'm not going to go off on that little rabbit trail. But God wants us to move into what he has for us. Now, this is a very important thing, and I'm not trying to scare you today, but, you know, uh, God wants us to encourage people, but he also wants us to warn people if, they need, if we need to. Amen. Amen. God came to me in 1979 in my truck, and he warned me about my life because I needed to be warned. So, you know, the, the, the problem with not moving ahead into the season is God's going to, whether you do or not. Amen. You don't want to become a, a memorial to a past move of God. Exactly. See, that's how churches die. Yeah. Maybe they were born as a church in a move of God, and God was doing this, and he was moving in a certain way and moving among a certain group of people. And so they got, you know, uh, they partook of that and got blessed by it and, and received life and established ministry and all these things were done. And then there comes a little bit of a change where God says, we're going to move in, in this way over here now. We're going to emphasize in this way and move this direction because he's always adding to us. He's not, he doesn't just give us one thing that he's restoring to the body of Christ and says, that's all of it. He says, okay, now you've got that. Now let's move on to the next step. Yeah. But a lot of people, whoop, wait a minute. No, 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 we don't do that that way around here. Come on, preach it. You know, Grandma taught me this, and that's the way it is, and I'm not going over there. Yeah. Yeah. And usually the biggest adversary to the new move of God in the earth is the old move of God. Yes. 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 Jesus called it old wineskins. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think he was referring to the shape of our complexion. He was talking about, of course, back in that day, they would take an animal skin and they would pour the, the grape juice into it. And as it fermented, that animal skin was soft and pliable. It would expand with the fermentation process and it could hold the wine. But then over time, it became old and brittle. And so to take the new wine or the new move of God and pour it back in that old wine skin it's going to start to expand, and the, the wineskin won't expand, so it's going to blow up. Eventually, it's going to break, and the wine will be lost. You and I cannot afford to be old wineskins. Come on, are you here? But to become a new wineskin, God has to challenge us to bring us into some things we don't understand. You don't know where you're going. I mean, you may have, you know, like, you may have some, like Joseph, God says, you're going to be a man of prominence and authority, and even your own family's going to bow down to you. That's all he knew. He didn't know where, when, how, how this was going to all come about. He didn't have a clue. Right. Amen? But God is not a liar. Amen. And if God tells you prophetically, as you spend time with him, see there again, that's what he was saying earlier, spend time with him. He wants to talk to you. 
It's not about knowing about somebody, some historical thing, or going through a bunch of of dead ceremony that doesn't mean a whole lot. It's about walking and talking, having a walking, talking, living, loving relationship with God. And I want to talk to him daily because I need him to talk to me daily to keep me on that pathway. But he will begin to challenge you to launch out into the unknown. Now look here in Hebrews, or excuse me, Isaiah 51, verse 1, it says, Hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness. How many of you want to do what's right? You that seek the Lord. How many of you want the Lord's will in your life? You want to follow him. Look, he says, under the rock whence, whence you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit where you were digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. Now what's going on here is the, the people from Israel were in bondage in Babylon, but now it was time for them to turn and go back to their promised land to fulfill their destiny. Yes. And they were all, in, everybody was entrenched in Babylon. They all had their families and their business. Some of them never knew the promised land. All they'd known was Babylon. But all of a sudden, here comes God's big prophetic voice coming out. Yes. Some prophet starts standing up saying, time to leave. Yes. And everybody listens to him and looks around and says, why in the world would I want to leave here? You're telling me to go out into a desert where there's no provision, there's no water, and I'm going to take my life in my hands to go back to a place that I heard is desolate, the temple's torn down, there are enemies now in the land, there's, people, you know, there's going to be adversaries, there's going to be all kinds of difficulties, and you're telling me, voice of God, through the prophet, you're telling me i got to get up and become very uncomfortable and even take my life in my hands and go out there? And that's exactly what he was telling them. Not exactly in the way they were thinking. Because where God guides, he provides. You're better off living in a tent in a desert with nothing, no provision naturally, than living in Babylon out of the will of God. Amen. I know the Lord told me one day, he said, John, I took a million people out into the desert from Egypt, and they went into a place where they had no provision whatsoever of any kind, I took care of, for 40 years, I took care of every need they had. Their feet didn't even swell. Their clothes didn't wear out. Uh, they were completely healthy. They had food. Every, they had everything they needed. Don't worry about your future. I can take care of you. Amen. Hallelujah. So God is saying through the prophet here, look back at Father Abraham. He's a rock. Now, in their thinking, you know, you see where Jesus taught, don't build your house, don't build your life on the sand, because the storm's coming, the waters are going to flow, the wind's going to blow, and if your foundation is sand, you're going to get undermined, and down you're going to go. But if you build it on the rock, and he defined what the rock was, he says, doing my sayings. What you hear me say to you, what I reveal to you, that is solid. You can take it to the bank. You can... Build your life on it. You can establish yourself on it. Now, from a natural perspective, it's going to look about like this. It's going to look like, whoa, this is scary. Come on, are you here? Amen. It's like Peter stepping out of the boat into the storm with Jesus. All the other disciples thought they were in the safe place. They weren't. They were in a sinking boat. Yep. Well, I'm not going out there. That's, you know, that's a storm out there. That's scary. Well... But you're in, in the boat when the water's filling the boat. You're going down, Jack. Get out there with Jesus. He's walking above it all. Yeah, but what if I start singing like Peter? Cry out to Jesus. He'll pull you up like he did Peter. Amen. See, the devil controls Christians with the spirit of fear. We've got to learn, and it's not easy. I've had to face it down. You're going to have to face the Goliath of fear in your life and know that because you have a covenant with God and that you're a king and priest, you have that kingly anointing like David had on your life and that God is going to enable you to, to remove whatever or whoever, I don't care how big, bad, and ugly they are, God will cause you to overcome that because of what he is in you and what he's put on you. But you've got to show up for the fight. Yes. 
not always be in flight. Shandai, hallelujah. He says, look under the rock from which you were hewn and the pit from which you were digged. He's using Abraham and Sarah, and he's saying, now let's, well, let's read it here. Verse 2. He says, I called him alone and blessed him. The word blessed there means, it's, it's where we get the, it's the Hebrew word that we get the word eulogize from. You know, when you hear, go to a funeral and you hear somebody talk about a per, the good characteristics of a person? They're speaking of who they are. Well, for when God eulogizes or when God speaks words like that, they're creative, powerful words that come to pass every time. What God says about you, he's still creating. What he says about, by the very fact that he said that to you or about you, it's done. It's created. That's why the enemy immediately reacts to try to get you to look at the wind and waves and say, oh, it's not happening, it's not happening. I preached two weeks ago, I preached a message on love. I didn't intend on preaching a message on love, but the Lord knew it was communion service and I didn't. (laughs) Shows you where I am in the scheme of things. I preached a message on, that week I had more opportunities to get my nose out of joint and get in strife. Why? The devil reacting to what God had established on Sunday. Don't be surprised. You know, what Peter says, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial as though something weird and strange is happening. This is the way he does it. This is the way he works. He's trying to get you to have more faith in what he's doing in the natural realm or messing with your mind than the tr- eternal word of God that's true. Because he knows if he can get you to do that, you'll, you'll start following him instead of following what God is saying. And it's not easy. You're going to have to rise up. You're going to have to have some Holy Ghost anger. You know, the Bible says that Saul heard what his enemies were doing, King Saul, and it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He became angry and went out and destroyed his enemies. Now, we get angry for wrong reasons sometimes. The Bible says be angry but sin not. It doesn't say anger is wrong. God has anger. But being angry for the right reasons and using the anger for the right purpose is the key. Hallelujah. I won't even charge you for that part. A little extra there. It says, look at this. Now, look what happened here. He says, these people are the ones I want you to build on. See, they had been in the land already, right? They were in the land. God gave the land to Abram, started the lineage, multiplied him, gave him Isaac, And all of that, and they started growing. They grew to 70 people in the land, and then they left and went into Egypt because God had told Abraham, he says, your people are going to leave this land that I've given you. They're going to be out of it for 400 years, and then they're going to return, and they're going to be established in the land. So they were, but they didn't do things God's way, and they ended up being chastised and had to be removed from the land so the land could rest and have its Sabbaths, which they didn't honor. And now they had to go. Now that God says, okay, now that's over. Now you're going back in to go on with my plan. Amen? Amen? But notice what he says. He goes all the way back to Abram. He says, I called him alone. I blessed him. I spoke creative words to him and over him and increased him. That's really all you need to know about your life is that God has called you. But notice the word alone. Now, he's called us as a group. There's no doubt about it. The ecclesia or the church. Uh, I'll build my church, Jesus said, my ecclesia, which really means more of a governing group than it does, you know, of of what we thought it meant. Called out ones to be a governing group, really. Well, that's another one. I won't get off on that. (laughs) Amen. I called him alone. Jesus wants a relationship with you between you and him. Your pastor can't be everything Jesus can be to you. Right. It's impossible. I, only, I have a role in your life. And I can't be Jesus. I, all I can do is operate in the, the shepherd's anointing. The great shepherd Jesus pours an, a shepherd's anointing, an under-shepherd anointing through me to do the things that shepherds are anointed to do. Past that, it's got to be between you and Jesus. Your husband or your wife can't be Jesus to you. Amen? He says, I called him alone. In other words, I, him and I, 
talking together. And if you go back and read it in Genesis, that's exactly what happened. I called him alone. I spoke words to him. I gave a creative word to him, a prophetic word for the future. And as, of course, he's jumping years here by saying it in this little verse, as he obeyed God, God increased him in every way. He was wealthy, naturally. He was increased, uh, you know, him and his wife couldn't even have children. They're almost 100 years old. God works a miracle. They have Isaac. And from Isaac came forth that multitude. Yeah. Now, the, uh, the uh, let's see, I got the wrong thing here. I was wanting to read a definition I'd written down. Here it is. The word Hebrew, Abraham's called a Hebrew. The word Hebrew, the root word for that in the, in the, in the Hebrew language means to cross over. It can mean to penetrate, or it can mean to cross over. That's why the Hebrews were called Hebrews. People were saying, oh, those are the people that crossed over. Those are the people that left Egypt, crossed over the Red Sea, and then went and crossed over Jordan into the land. Those are the crossover people. So you and I, you need to understand that you and that's who you and I are. Abraham's our root system father. Jesus is called the seed of Abraham. Abraham was like a seed planted that hit the covenant of God that began to grow that literally finally manifested in the fulfillment of that covenant in Jesus Christ. And now Jesus took what could only be done naturally because the price hadn't been paid for complete redemption yet, he took it into the spirit of full redemption, and now he's in the process of working to bring full restoration to the way things were before Adam and Eve even sinned. But Jesus is the fruit of Abraham's covenant, that Abraham was like that seed. Amen. People talk today about the Jewish roots. That's what it is. And, and it's good. I love studying the Jewish roots. It makes the Bible uh, come alive. Because you understand what they're talking about when you, when you study that. But uh, some people today, you know, there is, a, there is a danger in that. I see some people trying to live in the root system and not live in the fruit system. Right. Why would you want to go back and live in the root? You know, they, they get mad if you don't wear a little Jewish, what do they call that? A little, what is it? Yarmulke. Or you have to have a prayer, you know, a prayer garment or whatever. You know, you, yeah, I've, had, I've had people, I mean, they, they, you've got to do that. No, I don't. Why would I want to go back and do something that's part of the root system when I'm living in the fruit system? I'm not saying God might not speak to you and have you blow a shofar prophetically or have you do this or have you do that. But that's something the Holy Ghost needs to lead. We're under a system where the Holy Ghost is in control. See, I can, I can you know, and we've done it in church. We turn church into traditionalism. I can come in here and say, well, uh, these people... Uh, they're struggling not walking in love. I think I'm going to do a five-part series on walking in love. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's me trying to fix God's problems for him. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. Amen. We need to walk with the Holy Ghost every day. We need to be open to his voice. You'll be surprised some of the things he'll say to you. You'll be surprised some of the things he won't say to you. Amen. Now, there again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying those things are wrong. I'm just saying if you start substituting the Holy Ghost with that, you're just going right back under trying to manufacture something in the flesh, and it won't work for you. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. My little soapbox for the day there. But notice he called him alone. He called he and Sarah alone, blessed him, and increased him. Now, what did he call them to do? Cross over. I, he came to them after Abraham's father had died. He says, now, leave Ur of the Chaldees. Leave this place and go cross over Jordan and I'll show you where you're going when you get there. Yes. That's the part we don't like. I know. <laughs> That's why we don't know. We know we're going with God, but we don't know where we're going. And you know, one thing he's shown me over the years is, John, if I tried to show you where you're going, you wouldn't be able to understand it. Because we mature and grow in understanding and revelation 
And he might, and I'm not talking about a, a, play, a physical place necessarily. I'm talking about a place in God and his kingdom and who he is in you, you are in him and what he's using you for. When, until you can, you know, it's, it's like me trying to go to my youngest grandson, Daniel, and say, Daniel, uh, hey, here's what an automatic transmission's about and here's how it works. He's going to like, Grandpa, let's go play with toys. We're the same way. Jesus even said, he says, you know, to Nicodemus, who was supposed to be a spiritual leader, he said, I've, t I've shared earthly things, examples of you trying to teach you this about the kingdom. If you can't understand that, what are you going to do if I try to explain it to you from the, sp the real heavenly perspective? Right. It, both Jesus and Paul said to their followers, I have more things I want to share with you, but I can't because you can't receive it yet. So quit, don't ever become an expert. You'll quit learning. And you'll die spiritually right there. You'll be that old wineskin. And God will start moving in some way that you've never seen, even though it's scripturally based, and you'll, you'll be fighting the very move of God. And not participating. Now, we do need to test the spirits. We do need to check things out. We don't just buy into anything we hear somebody preaching. Matter of fact, you shouldn't believe anything you hear me preach if it can't be backed up uh, scripturally. I don't care who it is. Don't get into this blood thicker than water thing. Don't get into this, well, that's my pastor, and so he knows everything. No, no, he doesn't. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, help me, Lord. The Hebrew means to cross over. Let me give you just a couple of, uh, see, or let me just say this about, about Jesus in Luke 4 and over there when he came on the scene. You know, in Matthew, he came to the, at one point, the Pharisees, and he said, you guys can look at the sky and tell me, you can predict the future by the sky. You can tell me whether it's going to rain tomorrow or it's going to be sunny. But you don't know the signs of the times. And that word times is kairos in the Greek, which means that which time allows you to do. It's not time itself. It's not what's going to happen in a day in time in the weather. It's the spiritual weather forecast. It's God saying it's time. It's now a fullness of time. It is now a spiritual season for this to happen in the earth. And most times, now listen to this, you need to hear this. Most times when God says it's time for something, if you look around you in the natural realm, it looks like anything but time for that to happen. When God, you know, I knew I had the call of God on my life. I ran from it until I was 29. Finally answered the call of God. The Lord helped me. He brought me to the church I needed to go to. He trained me for four years in that church. And then all of a sudden, I walked in the church one day, 800 people in this church. I knew probably at least half of them. I walk in, and I felt like I walked into a strange church that uh, I was like a visitor. The Holy Spirit was witnessing to me, you're no longer here. Right. You're here, but you don't know you're no longer here. Right. Time to move on. And then he began a process of dealing with my wife and I and, you know, maneuvering us into his will to come here and pioneer a church in Madeira. And everything in my mind when John Purcell started trying to play God. Think it through. Figure it out. Everything in my mind, and then, of course, the devil jumped in and helped too, said, uh-uh, <laughs> you're not ready to do this. And, and, and the devil had a whole checking list of why I shouldn't do it. Part of it was me, how ill-prepared I felt. The other part was money. Right. Wasn't nobody supporting me, helping me. You know, there wasn't anybody behind me, so to speak. Right. All these things, it looked like in the natural realm, it wasn't the thing to do. But I had a problem. I had told God four years before, I'll do anything you tell me to do, even if I don't understand it. He must have made me add that part. Because now my word's on the line. The Bible says don't vow something and then not keep it. It says you're better off not to vow than to vow and break it. Because 16 years before that, I had made a vow that I would follow him into ministry. 
And when I got my heart right with him at 29, he says, now what about that thing you vowed to me and I called you to do 16 years ago? But I, I told him, I'll do anything you tell me to do, even if I don't understand it, as long as I know it's you. So I was, you know, I was, my neck was on the cho chopping block right there. I was committed. And so I just had to say, you know what? I'm going to cross over yes. from Fresno Clovis yes. to Madeira. Yes. Thanks God you did. For all I know, it's like Canaan. People are waiting over there to do me in. <laughs> and there was a few that were waiting over here to do me in. <laughs> I found out there were a few giants in the land over here, too. But you have to have that kind of a heart. You have to make up your mind and your heart. Uh, if you're going to do what God's called you to do, you've got to cross over. You've got to get out of comfy zone sometimes. You've got to do things your flesh doesn't want you to do. You've got to do things that seem irrational to your mind. See, our nation follows after the Greek mentality of if it's rational, then it must be real. If it's irrational, it can't be real. Right. And you know what? That's irrational. Exactly. <laughs> you can't exactly. uh, we could really run off on a rabbit trail on that one, but we won't. So God is saying to these people, yeah, I know you've been here for 70 years. Yeah, I know you're comfortable here. Yeah, I know you think your whole life's here. Yeah, I know the devil's been telling you every day that you're never going back. And you don't have a future in me. Some of you in here, he's told you that same lie. Too late for you. You've done too much bad. You've committed too many sins. He's probably even tried his favorite on you. You've committed the unpardonable sin. Anybody ever hear that one? You usually hear that one about five minutes after you're saved. I, I think the reason that happens is because the devil knows that you're going to figure that out pretty quick, so he's got to try to really hit you with that one first. Amen? But Jesus has set us free to be who we need to be. Amen? So you've got to be willing to cross over. And I just wrote down some folks here in the, in the Bible that crossed over. We mentioned Abraham. He crossed over, he and Sarah, and spiritually possessed the land and supernaturally possessed seed. Thank God he did. I'm saved today because of it. Moses. Well, let me actually, let me go over here. This list is better than that one. Abraham. He went from Ur into the promised land. And as we just said, you know, he, he received the land. God uh, gave him the land. God gave him a son. Gave he and Sarah a son. But during that whole time, there was another thing that happened. He crossed over again back into Egypt. Didn't he? Because there was, there was famine in the land. And so he ended up in Egypt, but he ended up getting rich in Egypt. Amen. And then he came back into the land. Isaac, his son, same thing. He left and went into Egypt, crossed over out of the land, came back into the land. Now, Egypt's a type and, and shadow of the world system. God doesn't want you to go worship the devil in the world. Right. But sometimes he'll take you into the world to spoil yes. the enemy's camp. Amen. I remember back when Oral Roberts was finishing up the, the, the uh, what's that tower called? City of Faith? That big hospital tower he built in Tulsa? No, that's the prayer tower is the smaller one, but I'm talking about the big high-rise building. You can see it when you get near Tulsa. You can see that thing out there. It's huge. He was finishing that up. That's probably been back, what, in the 80s or whenever it was. And he was a, a million dollars short. This is a multi-million dollar project. He was a million bucks short. And he got on t TV and he said the Lord told him that he needed to finish this. And what he said was, the Lord basically told me, you know, if you're not going to finish up what I'm going to have you do, you might as well just come home and be with me. The, the TV folks took it and they spun it as, saying, as, Ab as uh, Oral Roberts saying, if you don't finish this project, I'm going to kill you. Signed, God. But that's not what he said. But he was a million bucks short. And some guy that owned a, a dog racing track in Florida, wasn't a Christian, just a man in Florida. He liked to hear old Robert preach, you know, he, this, that, and that. He, you know, where the greyhounds race around the track, you know, gambling on uh, greyhounds and all that. He called Earl Roberts and said, I'm giving you a million bucks. Glory. 
and gave him a million bucks. Because all the tight-fisted Christians wouldn't. That's right. Amen. Don't tell me there wasn't a million bucks laying around in the body of Christ somewhere that somebody could have given. There's a lot of wealthy Christians. But they were probably living out of my opinion of Oral Roberts. And man, you would have thought the devil himself showed up and gave Oral a hug on TV and gave him a million bucks or something. People went nuts. Criticizing him, attacking him. You know what? You know, and here's the old saying to people, that's the devil's money. No, <laughs> no it's not. Read your Bible. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and even all they that dwell therein. Amen. He created it, he owns it. Yep. And if he wants to reach over and take some unsanctified money, put it in my pocket, when it hits my pocket, it's going to get sanctified. Because I'm going to use it the right way for the right purposes for the Lord. But we can be so goofy sometimes yeah. Yeah. in the body of Christ. Yeah. Larry Huggins has a friend that uh, he was a part of a, a Native American tribe and their money was coming from the gambling casino. And, uh, you know, they, I, I guess they were kind of struggling with whether to take the money or not. And Larry, I don't think Larry even knew this at the time. He'd have to clean the story up probably. But I'm trying to do it as best I can remember. And, but he, he was in service one day, and he went up to this pastor, and he said, God just told me he's going to feed you through the beak of a dirty bird. <laughs> he was referring to Elijah. Yes. When Elijah prophesied the drought and went out and sat by the brook, yes, God sent a raven. Now, a raven under the law was a dirty bird. It was an unclean animal. Yes. But God brought flesh every day to Elijah while he spent that time out there by that brook, he brought him provision through a dirty bird. Yes. If God wants to bless you through a dirty bird, let him. Don't get religious. Yes. Don't cut off. God's trying to bless you to be a blessing. Yes. Don't wrap your head around a bunch of religiosity and miss what God wants to do. I have no idea why I said that, but I'm not taking it back. <laughs> Isaac, well, yeah, it was because we were talking about them going into Egypt. Jacob, the third one. He was back and forth, wasn't he? You know, when he, he uh, connived around and got his brother's blessing, got scared of his brother, headed out across, crossed over, worked for 15 years, serving his tightwad conniving uncle that was more of a conniver than he was, and then came back across, crossed back in. He had to cross over, back and forth, to do, get some things done. Joseph, Joseph... Uh, you know, Joseph had that dream that we talked about him earlier. He had that prophetic dream from God. Those couple of dreams, actually. And, you know, and he didn't know what to do with it. He just shared it with everybody. God says that, you know, and they understood that what he was saying is somehow you guys are going to end up bowing down to me. They thought he was being some arrogant, you know, pride-filled teenager. And his brothers were so mad. They didn't like him anyway because he was daddy's favorite. And they were going to kill him if it wasn't for Reuben that uh, kept that from happening, and they threw him into a pit. Have you ever, had, uh, ever said about your life, this is the pit? That used to kind of be a, uh, uh, something that you would hear years ago, us old folks, remember? This is the pit, man. Well, I was reading a word this last uh, week on the Elijah List, which is a prophetic clearinghouse thing on the Internet. It's really a blessing. I like to read it. It's really encouraging. It's amazing how many times after Sunday I'll get on there on Monday, yeah. and what we've preached on on Sunday is on the, on the list there. Yeah. But this lady was talking about Joseph in this word she was uh, writing on the list there, and she said that uh, the word pit, which is where what happened with Joseph, instead of murdering him, they threw him in the pit, and then they sold him into slavery. She said the word pit, God gave her an acronym in line with all of this that was happening to Joseph to bring him into his, the fullness of the promise. And she said this acronym was this, P-I-T, PIT, Place Initiating Transition. What is crossing over? Transitioning. Going from one place to another. Just like the seasons. Spring is that transition season. You don't know how to act sometime during that season. Is it going to be cold today? Is it going to be hot? One day it's raining, the next day it's hot. 
Pit. Anybody ever ended up in a pit? What's a pit? That's a place that no matter how, many, how long you scratch the walls and try to dig your toenails into the walls, you can't get out of it. And the devil's telling you you're going to live there and die there. There's no provision. It's over for you. You ever felt that? That hopelessness just wants to grip you. But really what that was, see, God had to get Joseph to Egypt if he was going to make him prime minister. Right. And you know the story of Joseph, how he went from the pit to Potiphar's house, the head general of Egypt. He became his slave, his, uh, working in the house there, rubbing elbows with the who's who of Egypt. Why? Because Joseph was going to be given a governmental position, and he was going to have to know who these people were and how to move among them. Right. Amen. Amen. But that's not what it looked like to Joseph. He went from the pit to Potiphar's house. Then he went from, the, from Potiphar's house from, because of the false accusation of Potiphar's wife. He went into the king's prison. Yep. Not just the common prison, the king's prison. Yep. Pit, Potiphar, prison. And in prison, what happened? He met guys that were in the very presence of the king. And used the, the prophetic gift of dream interpretation and ministered to them. One of them got a good prophecy. The other one didn't get a too good prophecy. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? But that led to the guy that got the good prophecy saying, Hey, Pharaoh, you've had a dream about some cattle? I know some dude in prison over here that's good at interpreting that stuff. So everything that happened from the pit to Potiphar to the prison ended up to, in the palace. Everything that looked bad in the natural realm moved him a step closer to the fulfillment of his destiny. Now, I'm not saying that all of the bad stuff was God. The devil always comes during transition and attacks us and tries to make our suffering worse. But if you've got it put in perspective and you understand this is not about me living in a hole in the ground the rest of my life. This is not about me being somebody's slave the rest of my life. This is not about me staying in jail or prison the rest of my life. This is about me moving into something and I'm going to eventually stand in the fullness of what God has promised me. That's where I'm going. And if I have to go through these things to get there, I don't care what the devil does. He's going to lose. God and the devil aren't buddies. They aren't partnering up to do this. God's saying, I'm moving you in this direction. And the devil says, oh yeah, watch this. It wasn't God that caused Potiphar's wife to falsely accuse Joseph. It wasn't God that put murder in his brother's hearts. Amen? Jesus straightened that whole thing out when he got accused of casting out Satan by Satan. He says... The devil's not that crazy. He's crazy, but he's not that crazy. He's not going to try to do something and then tear it up on purpose. Come on, are you here? What's this all about? It's about crossing over. Everybody that's ever walked into the fullness of the purpose of God in their life has gone through this. And that's why people feel empty. That's why people feel like unfulfilled. Because until you walk with God into what he has for you, Life is always going to be less than in some way in you and around you than it needs to be. And God wants you to feel that because he wants you to come to him and say, what's wrong here? What do I need to do? What adjustment do I need to make? What, what, what kind of thinking needs to be changed in me? Amen? Amen? Praise God. I don't know if this is helping you or not, but it's helping me. And then we have Joshua. Joshua had to do what? He had to take a young generation of people who hadn't even been brought into the covenant. They, had to, they got circumcised after they crossed over. Their parents were so discouraged by being left in the desert for 40 years, even though their natural, means, their natural needs were being met. See, they had settled for survive instead of thrive. They were survivors. They were on a camping trip for 40 years in the desert. And you know that they weren't all happy campers. Oh, man, did we blow it. I can't believe that we did that. And then, and then, and then you know, gripe and complain and moan and gripe. I'm sure there was some of that stuff going on. 
And maybe some of those younger generation from 20, because it was 20 years and over, if I remember correctly, that had to die off in the desert before God could take the younger ones in. Maybe those under 20, you know, they'd go up, they'd, hear, they'd heard the story about how Moses was allowed to go up onto Pisgah, up onto the mountain, and look over and see the land, the, the inheritance, the promise. And so they'd climb up that mountain and they'd look out there where he looked and go, wow. Uh, and they'd read Deuteronomy, what Moses wrote the last six and prophesied the last six weeks of his life before he left here at 120 years old. It's a land of hills and valleys, a land that drinks in the rains. They have rain there. We don't have rain where we live. But they have rain there. They have this, they have that. Amen? Not just the land of just enough, not just survival. But he wants us to thrive. Fine. Because unless you learn to thrive and be blessed, you can never be a blessing. God doesn't want you to live your whole life on the gifts of the Spirit, him having to rescue out of one thing after another. Now, he does that for us, and he'll do it if the devil attacks us. I'm not saying we shouldn't be thankful for that or even receive that or reach out for it. But God's trying to get us somewhere to where we are the go-to person for people in this earth, where we are blessed with more than enough. We've got more joy than we need and we can share. We've got more wisdom. We've got more provision. We can be that shining, glorious example where when people that don't know God look at us and go, man, I want to serve the God they're serving. Look what he's done in their life. Amen. They're not having to take drugs to survive every day. Amen. They got the most high. They don't need the low high. Amen. Amen. It's true. But there's crossing over involved. Joshua had to take those guys in. There's a lot we can say about that, but I'm going to move on. Elijah. Elijah was in the promised land. He was born there. He was raised up, national prophet, confronted Ahab and Jezebel. All of that stuff that went on there. But then there came a time in Elijah's life where God says, it's time to transfer the mantle on your life to Elisha. And so God says, go to this town. Elijah looks at Elisha and says, God's told me to go over here. You stay here. Elisha says, uh-uh. Last time I heard from God, he said, go with that man and don't leave him, no matter what. So even if you say it, I'm going to do what God's told me to say, not what you told me to say. And so you know the story. He followed him from one city to another. And then he followed him. They crossed Jordan. They crossed over out of the promised land. I used to wonder about that when I'd study that and read that. I'd think, God, why would you make them go across Jordan outside the land? I don't get that. And he said this to me one day. He said, because every person that's going to do my will and have all I have for them has to cross over on their own. They have to cross over at their time in the way I tell them to. And Elisha needed to cross over. He needed to pick up that mantle of Elijah. And notice what what he said about it. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He was connecting himself with what had been imparted to him. And when he struck the waters, the waters parted. And he knew, I've got it. I'm going in. And I'm going to go into what God has for me. Amen. If he'd have listened to even a man who was a prophet, if he'd have listened to his opinion or his words, I kind of think maybe Elijah was saying that to him as a test. Let's see how bad this boy really wants what God's got for him. Am I going to be able to dissuade him and run him off? And then when they got to that place where it was getting ready to happen, Elijah was going to be taken into heaven by the chariots of fire. He said to Elisha, what do you you want? He said, I want a double portion of what you got. He said, well, that's a hard thing. (laughs) That's a hard thing to to do. But But he said this. He said, but if you see me when I leave, you've got it. What was he asking for? He was asking for the seer's anointing. He was asking for the prophet's anointing. He was asking for that comprehension of the spirit realm, which is what a prophet needs if they're going to be able to do their ministry. And when Elijah, when the chariots and fire and all that came, they came in the spirit. He saw the horse. He said, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen thereof. He saw in the spirit realm. He was able But then he had to take that and cross over and walk in it. Jesus crossed over. 
He crossed over from heaven into the earth. He was willing to humble himself. He was willing to trust his father. He was willing to do whatever he had to do in order to redeem mankind. And that meant coming from a place of perfection, total peace, no tears, no pain, no anything that we know in this earth. When he stepped in here, it would be like you leaving your home, going to the most grotesque garbage dump you could find on the face of the earth that stunk every day and walking in there and camping right at the base of that pile of garbage and living there. That's what it was like for Jesus to come to the earth. Because of sin. But he was willing to do it. He crossed over, came through the womb of a virgin and redeemed us. Even Paul, Saul, he was known as, on the road to Damascus, he crossed over chasing Christians, trying to kill them, and put them in prison. He crossed Jordan, headed for Damascus over in Syria. And when he crossed over, he thought he was going to do what he was going to do, but he had a little encounter. He got knocked off of his horse. Jesus confronted him. And then years later, he crossed back over into the promised land, and became Paul the Apostle. And God gave him the privilege of writing somewhere from half to two-thirds of the New Testament, explaining the in Christ truths. I'm glad he didn't get over there and encounter Jesus and just say, oh, man, I'm so glad I'm saved. Now, man, I'm so ashamed of what I did to all those people back over there in Israel. I don't think I'm ever going to go back over there. I'm not, wor I'm not worthy to go back over there. Well, he spent the time with God he needed to to get things straightened out and to make the, the transition in who he was. And then he went back and was willing to face whoever, whatever, however, in order to fulfill his call. Amen? Praise God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I think we'll just leave it there as far as the list goes. Turn with me one more time to one more thing. Turn with me over to Isaiah 43, verse 18. In 2008, the weekend my son was, was diagnosed with leukemia, I felt like zero. I felt like I was in the pit. The enemy was hammering my mind all weekend, telling me my son was going to die. I was resisting it. God was giving me scripture, but it was a battle. And when you're in a battle, when you're in a fight, it wears you out. Where's your natural man out? I was wore out Sunday morning. And I said, God, you say stupid things when you're tired, you know. Yeah. Right? right? I said, God, if anything happens in that service today at church, it's going to have to be you. Duh. That's every service, right? Yeah. That's all the time. That's every breath I take, right? And I just opened my Bible. I wasn't playing Bible roulette, you know. But I, I just opened my Bible and looked down, and I looked at this verse, verse 18, in Isaiah 43, which, by the way, is in that same... When you get past chapter 40 in Isaiah, the, the prophet shifts from them being in, the, in Babylon and in the land for 40 years or 70 years. He shifts over into going back. See, God always starts talking about where you're going a long time before it's uh, time for you to go because he's got to convince you to go. He's got to get it in you so you'll go when the time's right. Do you know, God started talking to me two years before we, we bought this building about the building. Not, not, he didn't show me it was this building, but he talked to me about a building and he started telling me things about it and even about other people that were connected to it that I couldn't figure out why he's talking to me about these people. He needs to tell them about them, not tell me about them. But he was preparing me because we needed to cross over yeah. from that other building into this one. And he knew me pretty well. Yeah. He knew how I was about transition. He even told me one time, he said, John, you've never done transition very well. Yeah. And he's right. Yeah. I'm a real kind of a, you know, whoa, wait a minute, let's figure this all out first. That's my natural man. And we do need to make sure we're hearing God. And not become part of the ready, fire, aim group. Ready, fire, aim. Amen. 
And so that morning, back in 2008, I looked down at this scripture. And as I began to study, I realized it was God was saying, we're going somewhere here. We're going to transition. We're going to cross over. We're going to get out of Babylon back into what God has for us. And my friend, right now, in this nation and in the church, that's exactly what God's doing. And if you will listen to him, instead of getting all, you know, worried about, oh, my God, the Antichrist is coming, and oh, the one world order, and all, all that stuff's going to happen. Big whoopee. Right. Who cares? Yeah. Read the other side of the coin. There's going to be a harvest like none other. Yeah. The book of James, James says that God's like a farmer who's watching his crop grow on the ground in the earth and he is waiting, he's patiently waiting. It's talking about the patience of God in there. He's patiently waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. We're going to have a mighty, mighty, mighty harvest in our generation. Hallelujah. We're going to cross over into it. But he says here in verse 18, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Now he's not saying just forget about everything behind you. He's saying don't live in that. Right. Can't live in the past and go forward. Right. Can't drive a car looking in the rearview mirror, you'll have a wreck. That's why they put two real big windows right there in front of you and a little mirror this big. Because they want you to glance at that and make sure somebody's not going to cut you off or whatever. Or you're going to cut them off. But they want you to look most of the time at where you're going. We can learn from the past, but we can't live in the past. Behold. Now the word behold means get this. You know, let this become revelation to you. I will do a new thing. New thing. People, some people get upset when you say that in the church. Well, God ain't doing anything new. His words to step. He's not talking about something new beyond the, the scripture or the canon of scripture. He's talking about something different than what you've been living in. I want some new things in some areas. Now it shall spring forth or flow forth. Shall you not know it? When Jesus showed up and it was opportunity for the Pharisees to cross over into the season that he was walking in, they didn't know it. You can be right in the middle of a great move of God and not even know it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He says, now look, he addresses the situation of crossing over right here. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. See, these people that he was prophesying to, the fastest way back to their land was through that desert. And if you, you launched out into that without any water or enough water or whatever, you're going to die. From a natural perspective. God says, no problem. I will cause the atmosphere, the atmosphere, even in the desert, to be such that it will bless you while you're going. You're going to have rain in the desert. You're going to have outpouring of my spirit in the desert on you. And it will manifest however it needs to. If it needs to manifest as rain, that's what you'll get. He says, I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me. Even the animals are going to know more than people do sometimes. How many of you remember the story of the prophet, you know, that went to help a king curse Israel? He's riding on his donkey. And this guy's a seer. He's a prophet. Yes. Sees into the spirit realm. And there's an angel that had with, was there to withstand him, had his sword drawn, and was ready to kill him. The donkey saw the angel, and the prophet didn't. You get wrong motives in your heart, and your donkey will know more spiritually than you do. It's true. Amen. That, that's an example right there in the Bible. You know, if you study that story, it's really neat. One of the words in the Hebrew, because you know, it looks like God's kind of psychotic there if you read that. Because the prophet comes to him and says, can I go with this king? He says, no. So he goes back and says, can't go. King sends him a whole bunch of more men and tries to bribe him even bigger. So he goes back to God and says, can I go with him? God says, go, but, you know, da 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 and when you read that, that word in Hebrew, that second time he told him he could go, he said, go, but don't you connect with what they're doing. Right. 
Don't you pick up the same heart they've got. Right, right. But what did he do? He did exactly what God told him not to. Yeah. Matter of fact, if you read his, his uh, history, it, he ended up dead because of it. But I don't want my weenie dogs at home knowing the angels are in my house and I can't see them. Come on, are you here? I don't want some little five-year-old kid over here and I've had it happen to me. Pastor, what? I saw a big angel standing behind you this morning and he had a sword pointed at the ground and he was holding the handle like this while you were preaching. Yes, sir. And I knew that little kid was just as sincere as could be. Amen. One preacher one time, his little four or five-year-old boy kept seeing an angel, kept talking to it, and finally the dad, you know, he'd ask him, what are you doing? He says, the angel, and blah, blah, blah. So he'd ask another minister, he says, what do you think about that? And he says, well, if it was me, next time he's talking to the angel, I would ask him to ask the angel, how come you can't see him? Yeah. So he did. His little boy's talking like this one day, and he says, who are you talking to? He says, I'm talking to the angel. He says, well, would you ask the angel why I can't see him? So the little boy goes, my dad wants to know why you can't see it, or he can't see you. He goes, oh. He said that you can't see him because your eyes have beheld too much evil. And he said, but that can change because uh, your eyes will be more open as you focus on the right things. Shandai. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Well, it doesn't matter. I can just watch this and look at that and read that. And yeah, if you want to be blind, you can, I guess. Well, you're just judging me. No, I'm not. I'm telling you, don't be stupid and blind. Because I love you. I have to tell myself the same thing. I'm tempted just like anybody else. And I'm not saying I've got it all figured out either. But what I am saying is, we've got to be willing to do what it takes to cross over. The beasts of the field will honor me, the dragons of the, and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. To, now, why am I doing this? Just to feed the birds? No, to give drink to my people, my chosen. You are chosen. You're a chosen generation. You have a purpose. You have a fulfillment. He's trying to cross you over into what he's doing now on the earth, what he's going to do in this nation, what he's going to do in this world. Yes. Joshua and Caleb were the only two old dudes that got to cross over with the younger generation. Why? Because they had the same heart the younger generation had. They had it for 40 years. Joshua was upset and so was Caleb because that first generation, their generation, wouldn't go in. God says, that's it. These people are not going to go in because they've rejected me. But you, Joshua, and you, Caleb, because you have another spirit, you're going to live a long time and you're going to go in there. And when Caleb got in there as an 80-year-old man, he said, I want that mountain for my inheritance and I can climb, I'm still strong, I can climb that hill and take that mountain. Hallelujah. They had a crossover spirit. They had a crossover mentality. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. 21, verse 21, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. It causes people to praise God when you have your fullness of, when you're walking in the power of God, when you're walking in the, the fullness of what God has for you. Amen. Glory to God. And then let me read these, these verses right here in chapter 44, and I'm done. You believe that, right? Okay. Verse 1. Yet now. Everybody say now. now. Not later. Now. 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 Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. There it is again. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. You've got to get on the journey and get out in the desert to get thirsty. If you're still living in Babylon, drinking out of the wells of Babylon, you're not going to be thirsty. You've got to take a risk on getting thirsty. Put yourself in a place to get thirsty, Amen. 
He says, I will pour waters upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will, now here he goes, he shifts it into the spirit. I will pour my spirit upon your seed, your family, your children, your lineage, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren. We did Sister Dorothy Leroy's graveside service Friday. Her and Bob had 44 grandkids. And four, uh, no, I think it was four great-grandkids and like, Four great, great grandkids. Yeah. Hallelujah. He'll bless your family, friends. You crossing over is going to affect your family. He says, I'll pour out my spirit upon your seed, my blessing upon your offspring, and they shall spring up among the grass as willows by the water course. See, they're going to be in that outpouring of that spirit, that blessing, that river of God. They're going to grow up and they're going to be planted by the rivers of living water. Hallelujah. And even in old age, the older I get, I like them old age scriptures. Even in old age, you'll prosper and bring forth. Hallelujah. Has this helped you today? Well, I hope the Holy Ghost has given you a little bit of a kick in the pants. Like he does me. See, he gets on me, then I get on you. That's the way it works. He straightens me out in these areas, and then I help share that with you. So don't, don't get all twisted up, upset. Don't be like that old generation. Oh, um, uh, you know, God's brought me out here to kill me. He's not Pharaoh. God is not the devil. He's even better than your earthly father. You may have had a good earthly father, or you may not have had a father that was there at all. God's better than any earthly parent. And he's looking out for you. And he's saying to you, I don't care how old you are. What I'm talking about is a spiritual thing. Yes. It may involve moving around, going to a different this or that, or being in a different business or whatever, or, or starting a church or not starting a church, whatever. But I'm telling you, we are in a season, and there's going to be those that cross over and enjoy what's coming. Yes. And there's going to be those that die in the desert. One thing I've noticed down through the years is that when we go through transitions in the earth like this is a lot of people die. They just do. They just start dying. I knew that this year, coming into this year, would be, be, that, transi- be that start of that transitioning thing. God's been building up to it, but now it's time to move into it. And man, people start dying left and right. People that I knew. People, you know, prominent people in society. I'm not saying I know every reason why everyone dies. Sometimes it's just their time to go home. But I believe that there's a lot of them probably that they've said, nope, I'm not crossing over. God says, well, then you're just going to have to die in the desert. I can't afford to have your unbelief, doubt-filled mouth and attitude and spirit among my army when we're going in here taking Jericho and bringing the giants down and taking the land. I love you. But if you're going to be part of the problem instead of part of the answer, you just come here and be with me. Amen. We don't like that side of it. But it's true. So just listen to him. And wherever or however he challenges you, spend time with him. He's going to help you cross over. It's, you're not, it's not going to be this thing you've got to figure it all out. He's going to lead you across. You're going to get up one day and he says, see the Ark of the Covenant over there? Go over there and stand behind it. Because when those priests step in the water, this whole thing's going to open. You're going to walk right through it. Amen. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Indeed, we are in a time of shifting and changing, rearranging, lifting up, bringing down, pulling down, uprooting, destroying the enemy's things that he's built and structured and planted in our nation and in our, in our own lives, in our families. But God, you're saying it's time for the new to begin. You're saying it's time for us to be that pioneer, have that same pioneering spirit that Abraham had, to be a Hebrew, one who crosses over, one who crosses over, one who says, I'm tired of living in the desert. I'm tired of just getting by. I know there's more. I know I was created for more. And we're willing to take the chance 
which is no chance at all when we follow you over into what you have for us. I pray, God, for everyone under the sound of my voice, both through the Internet and in this room today, I pray that the spirit of boldness, because they are righteous people, they want to follow you. And your word says the righteous are as bold as a lion and that the wicked flee when nobody's even chasing them. God, I thank you that the spirit of boldness, the spirit of Abraham, the spirit that was on Jesus and on the Apostle Paul and Elijah and Elisha and all those we mentioned, God, may there be a spirit, a pioneering spirit that comes upon them, that they're willing to step out into that virgin territory, that new place, and say, God, let Abraham alone, he he and Sarah. He blessed them. He spoke over them when they were obedient to follow him. He released his creative word and power on their life. And increase came to them. And increase is coming to me. God is going to multiply all that he has put in me and through me. Not only financially and the the ways of keeping us. But God He's going to multiply the seed and multiply the harvest. I join up with the harvest crew this morning, Lord. I want to be a part of the harvest. I don't want to go to heaven and have to peek over the balcony of heaven and watch them do it on earth. I want to be a part of that which you've ordained for me to be a part of and go home when my, my time is done. I pray that for every person in this room in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Some of you have been trying to get out of things. Some of you have been trying to get out of debt. Some of you have been trying to get out of a sickness. Some of you have been trying to get out of being depressed all the time. Some of you have been just, you know, you've tried to get a, God says, follow me and cross over and you'll leave behind the things that were hindering you. Do what you have to do to cross over and you'll find that you'll be different on the other side. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a minute. Is there anybody who's never received Christ as your Savior? You've never opened your heart and said, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. I need you to come and save me from my sins. You see, Jesus can't give you his eternal life until you give him your life from your heart. So if you've never done that, then you're not in his kingdom. I love you, but I have to tell you the truth. He created you, but you're not his child. Jesus told the Pharisees, you're of your father, the devil. They were very religious, but they didn't know God. They weren't in God's family. God says if you will give him your life, your heart, you'll acknowledge that you need him as your Savior. He'll come into your life. Jesus will give you his life as you give him your life. Is there anybody here today that needs to do that? Just lift your hand. We'll pray with you. Anyone at all? Everybody here is born again, saved, child of God? Okay. Well, listen. Cross over. Make up your mind. Make up your heart. Don't retire. Refire. I'm getting old and I've got, and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do, no, you're not. Yeah, that's what you think you're going to do. No. But it's not going to come out the way you think it is. Not if it's not God's plan, it ain't. No. Amen. Well, I don't want to get out and have to do a bunch. God's going to only lead you into what he has for you to do and he's going to do it for you and through you. But you've got to be like Moses at 80, if need be. Whatever you say, I'll go do it. The performance is up to you, Father. Let's stand this morning. Praise God. This bless you? Help you? Encourage you? Make you mad? Frustrate you? (laughs) Hallelujah. I'm excited. I'm excited because I know we're going places. If you need prayer for any reason, just feel free to come up. But otherwise... Karen's going to be ministering tonight. Oh, Karen got raptured. Oh, oh there she is in the back. <laughs> She's going to be ministering tonight, and so let's get together. And Boy, Sunday nights are fun. How many of you Sunday night folks? We have a good time on Sunday night. So come on back and be with us. Lord, bless your people. Give them rest this afternoon and refreshing. And we thank you for tonight and all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you tonight.